you know, so we have these, we have this upcoming meeting, uh, it, it, September 18th. It's happening, it's starting the day after uh, Rosh Hashanah ends on September 17th. Um, I'll read this last thing and then uh, this is a quote from their June article. It says, this is what they're recommending in these 17 different uh, sustainable goals. It says, at the global level, a once-in-a-generation commitment is needed to overhaul the international financial and economic system so that it responds to today's challenges, not those of the 1940s. It is essential that countries have the resources needed at scale to invest in both their immediate recovery and in long-term sustainable development outcomes, including climate action. A surge in SDG financing is needed with a SDG stimulus of $500 billion per year with simultaneous reforms of the international financial architecture. This is a lot here. To make it resilient, equitable, and accessible for all. It is also critical that developing countries have better access to global trade, science, technology, and innovation. Unprecedented collaboration among group uh, G20 members will be needed to support developing countries to advance SDG and climate action. It's not too late to turn this around. So here they're talking about over overhauling financial, overhauling financial and economic system. Mm -hmm. What do you think that let's speculate? <laughs> let's have a little fun here. What do you think this is referring to that? What are their goals here? Well, the ultimate, name of the game when you're talking about globalists is you want to erase the doctrine of the nation state. In other mm -hmm. words, their thinking is our problems are global in nature, so they're not going to be resolved through individual nations. So ultimately they want to do is bring in kind of a superstructure, a transnational structure that the other nations of the earth have to acquiesce to. And supposedly we all have to do this because our problems are global in nature and the only solution is global government. And so it's a way really to consolidate power into fewer and fewer hands. Mm -hmm. And I think here, the as we've seen, th this to me, this reeks of the Great Reset. Yeah. To overhaul the international and economic system is to respond to today's challenges. So... What I just read was, we need to reset it because in in order to respond to what they deem are the crises, the fear mongering that they just spent on the first part of it, we got to reset everything. Mm -hmm. And economically, financial and economics, you're like, well, that sure sounds interesting. That economics appears in Revelation 13, yeah. which we see as that snapshot as the end. Yep. But again, the stage setting, how does it get there? Well. We all believe that that snapshot of Revelation 13 is a, most likely a cashless or digital type system or something, at least cashless, economic. But how do you get there? Obliterating, <laughs> that's my word, or overhauling. The, it, we see that's what's going on now, right? With, with CBDCs, mm -hmm. uh, with the Fed now, that's just uh, one government part of it. Uh, they really do need to get rid of cash, right? Yeah, I mean, the citizen has to shrink in terms of privacy, autonomy, the state has to grow. So all these things you're, you're reading about here is pushing us, you know, in the, in that direction. Now this, we want to be clear is not the mark of the beast. Correct. Cause yep. we don't have the beast yet. Yep. Um, I, my understanding is that system is not really fully functional or let me put it this way up and running yeah. until the second half of the tribulation yep. period, yep. basically. But, as we said earlier, prophecies can't be fulfilled in a vacuum. I mean, you can't go from a um, independent and prosperous America where citizens have autonomy and freedom mm -hmm. to that kind of system that we're talking about in Revelation 13 without a stage setting transitional period. So that's the category I put put these things Absolutely. in. It's, it's inching us. Maybe that's not even the best word because it seems to be happening pretty quick. <laughs> but we're, we're, us? we're being, what was it? Cass uh, Sunstein in the Obama administration has the book called Nudge. Mm. You know, we're being nudged in this uh, globalist direction. I think the the, the CEO of BlackRock, the tape that surfaced in 2017, 
where he basically made a statement that you know we you know people have to be forced into correct <laughs> correct behavior. Yep, we're, we're being pushed, nudged, whatever word you want to use, you know, into this system that ultimately will become the mark of the beast system. Yeah, exactly. And and so again, we have for those listening, we have this we have the snapshot of the end of or the snapshot of of a system in place, but then going back that these are all just part of the stage setting. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're not saying that this is the mark of the beast or this is revelation 13. Clearly it's not, but the snapshot we have, we extrapolate backwards mm -hmm. and we go, Oh, this idea of overhauling the financial system. We think, well, that certainly would make sense of how they would do that. So that when that time, which we see is revelation 13. Uh, yeah, this is, this is where a lot of that begins. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's, 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 uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, we've kind of laid the foundation for this this conference that's coming up, mm -hmm. this UN conference that is seeking to reaffirm their words, uh, recommit, based on the 2015 Paris Agreement. So, for seven years. So, in in the Book of Daniel, uh, chapter nine, uh, this is where I think some people are making some parallels. Mm -hmm. uh, and my question is, okay, let's just see the fact is september 18th this is what they're doing they have the recommitment they have a seven-year goal to reach 2030 does this match what we would expect from an exegetical perspective in daniel 9 27 where i'll read it here it just says this is the esv he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So you have the New King James. Maybe mm -hmm. read the New King James and see how we have a little bit of variation. There. Yeah, it says, then he shall confirm a covenant with the many uh, for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until... The consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So we have uh, some similarities. We have some differences there. But I think let's start out with um, what, what we're answering today is, or we're trying to, is, is this prophecy in Venue 927, uh, could it be fulfilled by the United Nations making this recommitment with the nations of the world for seven years are they similar? First of all, I would say from an exegetical perspective, mm -hmm. what's the context? Who we have a covenant with the many? That's it's clear in Hebrew, la. Um, but what's the context here? Mm -hmm. Who who's who's this covenant with, and who and and uh, who's making it? Going back to even verse twenty four, help mm -hmm. us out. Yeah, I think the many is Israel. Um, if you go a bit over to Daniel eleven thirty three, I mm -hmm. think you'll see that the many there is defined as the nation of Israel. So, when people are saying this many is these conglomeration of nations that the UN is pushing towards these uh, SDGs, you know, I don't think the the two this passage and what we see happening there is exactly the same. Uh, furthermore, when you go back to Daniel 9, 24, and what people need to understand is God gave to Israel a clock, um, 483 of the 490 years have expired, leaving seven years left for the nation of Israel. That's our whole logic for believing in a future seven-year tribulation period. And when God entered into that clock with Israel as Daniel way back in the sixth century, you know, during the days of the Babylonian captivity, was given this 490-year stopwatch, as I'll call it, it says very clearly in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, that this is given, 77s, 400 year, 490 years, in other words, are determined for your people and your holy city. So who was Daniel's people? Israel. Who was his city? Jerusalem. So unless this uh, seven-year issue that we're talking about here with the United Nations specifically relates to Israel and the city of Jerusalem, which as far as I can tell, it does not, 
that specifically uh, 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 um, we're, we're not in a position to say this is that yeah I think that as you said there uh, I, there's a similarity of of there's some similarity of language I would say really the the uh, they're not calling it a covenant for sure but that's that's okay they, they, they're called an agreement the Paris climate agreement from 2015 um, I, I tend to look at this and say there's it's I'll be stronger <laughs> for I'll speak for Mondo mm -hmm. in that I think what's happening in September 17th and 18th or is it's not even possible mm. that this could be a fulfillment of Daniel 927 because of, of what we just said is that number one, the, unless that day comes and they say, this is specifically targeting Israel, which was, there's nothing in this little thing that we read mm -hmm. about that agreement specifically targeting Israel and the city of Jerusalem and the people of Israel, th then you'd have to say, well, is it this UN Secretary General? Because there's a he, it's a singular, right? There's going to be this one singular individual, not a plurality of, of, of agreements, yeah. right? So th there's several things that weigh against that even being possible. Right. Unless somehow the information that we get about that fall conference changes. Which I, hypothetically, I suppose one guy could arise out of there and say, heck with all the other nations, I want this ag agreement to be with Israel for seven years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that would be the only way I could say that it would be even possible to be fulfilled. Right. I mean, there, you use the language tightening up. There has to be a lot more tightening mm -hmm. uh, between now and then. However, stage setting. Stage setting. Global government. Yep. Seven year increments. Hmm. Seems like we're inching closer to what the Bible says, but. We can't say this is that. Yeah. And the uh, it's interesting, too, that there's, um, I guess, in my mind, we've got to remember that the original covenant was 15 years. So th they, didn't, they didn't really have anything significant about seven. It just happens to be that right now they're taking advantage of the current mm -hmm. political, geopolitical climate to say, let's reaffirm it. Now, could this be, if we're being very broad and generous, um, if they talk about seven years here and then maybe later... They like the seven-year idea, and the Antichrist likes the seven-year idea because they've used it before back in 2023, whatever that means. Uh, could that stage set in their thinking of a seven-year? Maybe. Uh, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what's happening now could evolve further mm -hmm. um, into what the Bible says. And that's what we – I think that's what we keep seeing – with all these stage setting things. That's the reason they're so interesting to us is they don't seem to make a U-turn <laughs> and go back the opposite direction. I mean, just the development of technology. It, you know, uh, you talked earlier about a cashless society. We're not moving further and further away from that idea. No, you know, we're no. getting, we're getting closer and closer. That's why all this stuff is so intriguing. It's just, in our camp, we have a lot of enthusiasts that haven't been taught the difference between stage setting and fulfillment, and they're making unwarranted conclusions is yeah. what I think is happening. And sometimes, you know, you use the word intimate. I think that's oftentimes it's it's like, well, I didn't say it. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, but you intimated it. And, and I know if I if I say to my wife something and I, can, I I'll leave myself out the caveat, um. She's, uh, I could say, well, I didn't say that. She goes, yeah, but you intimated it. <laughs> You're just as guilty, you know, in that regard. 